and search for meaning page 17. In the next few days, our curiosity evolved into surprise. Surprise that we did not catch a cold. There were many similar surprises in store for new arrivals. The medical men among us learned, first of all, textbooks tell lies. Some way they said that man cannot exist without sleep for more than a stated number of hours. Quite wrong. I've been convinced that there were certain things I just could not do. I could not sleep without this, or I could not line, live with that or the other. The first night in Auschwitz, we slept in beds, which were constructed in tires. On each tire, measuring about six and a half to eight feet, slept nine men directly on the boards. Two blankets were shared by each nine men. We could, of course, lie only on our sides, crowded and huddled against each other, which has some advantages because of the bitter cold. Though it was forbidden to take shoes up to the bunks, some people did use them secretly as pillows, in spite of the fact that they were caked with mud. Otherwise, one's head had to rest on the crook of an almost dislocated arm. And yet sleep came and brought oblivion and relief from pain for a few hours. I would like to mention a few similar surprises on how much we could endure. We were unable to clean our teeth, and yet, in spite of that and a severe vitamin deficiency, we had healthier gums than ever before. We had to wear the same shirts for half a year until they had almost lost all appearance of being shirts. For days we were unable to wash, even partially because of frozen pipes, and yet the sores, abrasions and hands, which were dirty from work in the soil, did not superate, that is, unless there was frostbite. Or, for instance, a light sleeper who used to be disturbed by the slightest noise in the next room, now found himself lying pressed against a comrade who snored loudly a few inches from his ear and yet slept quite soundly through the noise. If someone now asked us the truth of Dostoevsky's statement that flatly defines man as, as a being who can get used to anything, we would reply yes. A man can get used to anything, but do not ask us how. But our psych psychological investigations have not taken us that far yet. Neither had we prisoners reached that point. We were still in the first phase of our psychological reactions. The thought of suicide was entertained by nearly everyone, if only for a brief time. It was born of the hopelessness of the situation, the constant danger of death looming over us daily and hourly, and the closeness of the death suffered by many of the others. From personal convictions, which we mentioned later, I made myself a firm promise on my first evening in camp that I would not run into the wire. This was a phrase used in camp to describe the most popular method of suicide, touching the electrically charged barbed wire fence. It was not entirely difficult for me to make this decision. There was little point in, in committing suicide, since for the average inmate, life expectation calculating objectively and counting all likely chances was very poor. He could not with any assurance expect to be among the small percentage of men who survived all the selections. The prisoner of Auschwitz, in the first phase of shock, did not fear death. Even the gas chambers lost their horrors for him after the first few days. After all, they spared him the act of committing suicide. Friends whom I have met later have told me that I was not one of those 
whom the shock of admission greatly depressed. I only smiled, and I quite sincerely, when the following episode occurred the morning after our first night in Auschwitz. In spite of strict orders not to leave our blocks, a colleague of mine who had arrived from Auschwitz several weeks previously smuggled himself into our hut. He wanted to come and comfort us and tell us a few things. He had become so thin that at first we did not recognize him. With a show of good humor and a devil may care attitude, he gave us a few hurried tips. Don't be afraid. Don't fear the selections. Dr. M, the SS medical chief, has a soft spot for doctors. This was wrong by friends' kindly words from misleading. One prisoner, the doctor of a block of huts, and a man of some 60 years told me how he had entreated Dr. M to let off his son who was destined for gas. Dr. M coldly refused. But one thing I beg of you, he continued, shave daily, if at all possible, even if you have to use a piece of glass to do it, even if you have to give up your last piece of bread for it, you will look younger, and the scraping will make your cheeks look ruddier. If you want to stay alive, there's only one way, look fit for work. If you even limp, because let us say you have a small blister on your heel, and an SS man spots this, he will wave you aside, and the next day you are sure to be gassed. Do you know what we mean by a Muslim? A man who looks miserable, down and out, sick and emaciated, and who cannot manage hard physical labor any longer. That is a Muslim. Sooner or later, usually sooner, every Muslim goes to the gas chambers. Therefore, remember, shame. Stand and walk smartly. Then you need not be afraid of gas. All of you standing here, even if you have been here 24 hours, you need not fear gas. Except perhaps you. And then he pointed to me and sent, I hope you don't mind me telling you frankly. To the others he repeated, of all of you, he is the, the only one who must fear the next election. So don't worry. And I smiled. I'm now convinced that anyone in my place on that day would have done the same. 